So we were looking at last week um, the relevance of the eternal things that the wise men did. And it brought up a statement during the study is that our why must have eternal relevance. The things we do must have eternal relevance um, as opposed to just floating through life and really having no impact. But understanding that that which we do has an eternal relevance if we understand what we are doing. So we, we looked at this and then we finished on what the scripture I read out before from Hebrews, looking at the order of Melchizedek and that priesthood, that priesthood being an eternal priesthood. If you don't know what that means, under the law there was a Levitical priesthood or the priesthood of Aaron. That was a temporary priesthood. It was just a picture and a type of a greater priesthood to come. So when Jesus came as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, that priesthood ceased. That, that priesthood came to an end. And now you and I, as the body of Christ, under the most high priest, now have to function under this order. We don't function under a temporary order, under a temporary priesthood. We function under an eternal priesthood. So the eternal priesthood was here before you got here, and the eternal priesthood will continue after you leave. And even for all eternity, those in Christ shall continue to function in this eternal priesthood. So the priesthood is not just limited to this earthly world, this temporal world. It is something that has always been, something that will always continue. And this is the priesthood that we are a part of. So we're looking more into the eternal aspects of our being and making sure and challenging ourselves really with some questions of our why. Remember I said, when you look in the mirror in the morning, if you look in the mirror, ask the question, why? Why am I here? Why are you here? And if you can't answer with an eternal relevant question, you're going to struggle. Because your why must have eternal relevance in everything that we do. Does this make sense? So this is sort of what we looked at last week, if you weren't here. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, we base it on this. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In the Amplified, the part of it says, the things which are seen are temporal. Another part actually says, subject to change, which we'll look into that um, just a bit, bit, little bit down the track, which is a really important statement. The temporal being subject to change. We look not at the things which are subject to change, but we look at those things which are eternal. We looked at the eternal aspects just three of them last week, of the, um, the wise men. One, obviously seeking the word, which is eternal. They were seeking the Christ, that's the eternal, seeking of the word of God, seeking of his presence. We're seeking the eternal things. You know, when Jesus was, um, lost a lot of his disciples after he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me, a lot of his disciples left, majority of them. And he turned the final 12 and, and said, well, you're going to go too. And Peter responds with, Lord, where shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. So the words of eternal life. So when I'm reading the word, I'm participating in something eternal, not just temporal. The word is actually one of the only things, I won't say the only, but it's one of the only things that is actually tangible that we can see. The Lord has gifted us with an eternal reference for us to read. And yet the priesthood we can't see. All of these things that happen in the unseen we can't necessarily see. But the word I can see. This is eternal. What is written is eternal. Why? Because he spoke it. And anything he speaks becomes eternal. You can't take it back. We looked at the praise and worship. And we looked at revelation. That's what I spoke about again this morning. Everything happening around the throne of God. We are joining in with something. Not just starting something ourselves. We enter and join in with the praises going on around the throne with the angels and the saints and the elders and all the things that are going on. We participate in that realm. And then we obviously looked at the giving, again, which I touched on just before. When we give our tithe, give our offering, he, the high priest, receives them there. Where's there? There is heaven. So when I give, I'm giving of eternal substance. Because essentially when you give money, again, it's not just giving cash, it's giving of your time, it's giving of your effort, it's giving of your sweat, your tears, your emotions, and all the things you love to do on a Monday morning when you go back to work. 
You know that great feeling you get? Yes, it's Monday. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Got a witness somewhere, that's good. So this is the stuff we, we looked at last week. And I just want to continue a little bit this morning. We're going to have communion. Uh, but I want to look into a few things about basically three subheadings of the temporal, of the warnings of the temporal, and then some aspects of the eternal. So can you stay with me this morning? Yes, yeah? yeah? We're all switched on, ready to go? Yes, so remember, your, your why must have an eternal relevance. I just want to give credit to parents who bring their kids to church. Yeah, give them a clap. That's me too. So I was just thinking about this morning, in reference to praise and worship, in reference to the Word of God, we're not just bringing them here for something to do. We are exposing our children to something eternally greater than ourselves. We're not experiencing them to a sing-song. They don't, may not grasp it all, they may not understand it all, but the fact that we're exposing them to something which we can't see, but we know is happening, yeah. is a reason for me to bring them all the time. Yes, that's right. Because I know, being exposed to that realm, that it'll actually become their normal. That's right. Not some, oh, what am I going to do in here when I enter in? What's that, what's that sense? What's that feeling? What's that tangible? Is it intangible? All these different things. We're exposing our children to the greater eternal things of God. That's just a side note. That's not in my notes. Anyway, good on your parents. Keep bringing your kids to church. And if you don't have kids, keep coming yourself as well. So. <laughs> okay, eternal. If you don't know what eternal means, eternal means everlasting. It, it, it's everlasting. It means it doesn't change. Eternal things can't change. So God is eternal. He can't change. His kingdom is eternal. It can't change. Once it's eternal, it can't change. It's from everlasting to everlasting. Eternal means it has no beginning. And it doesn't have an end. It just is. Now for that, which in our temporal minds is actually hard to grasp, but that's what eternal means. Temporary or temporal means temporary. And anything temporary is subject to change. It means it can change and very will likely change. Your body is temporary. And if you look at a photo from 10 years ago to where you are now, you'll see that was temporary. My hair was a lot darker 10 years ago. It, that was temporary. <laughs> and I can't stop it. I, can't necess- I can do things to change it, but at the end of the day, it still changed and there's not much outside of the supernatural I can do to change that. And I'm okay with that. Okay? But you're the same, so don't laugh too much. <laughs> uh, Tim's pointing at his bald head, so some of us have hair, some of us don't have hair, so I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> some things are temporary, some things are eternal. Anything that is temporary is subject to change. And that's why he says, look not at the things which are temporal, but those things which are eternal. Get your eyes on things that don't change. Get your eyes on the kingdom. Get your eyes on the king. Get your eyes on God. Get your eyes on his word. Because those things never change. It's the eternal realm. It's the eternal things of God. Who's been caught up in a temporary moment of annoyance this week? You're all lying. (laughs) Me. I was dwelling, had some good time in the, in the morning with the Lord, thinking about eternal things. I've been talking to week nearly every day about eternal, temporal, eternal, temporal. Think about these great revelations of the eternal. Then it takes me 20 minutes to get from home to the highway down Terry Street. <laughs> oh, it feels like eternity. Like, come on, move, lights go green, do something. And I've gone from this great eternal revelation, I'll praise the Lord. To... Wow. Okay, what's the Lord teaching me? You're, you are allowing a temporal moment to destroy your eternal outlook. But they won't move. <laughs> oh. Anyone relate? Yeah. yeah, there we go. See, it's not just me. <laughs> oh, they yeah, need a bike. See there? There we go. <laughs> this statement then dawned on me during the week. We are eternal and temporal living at the same time. 
That equals tension. We are eternal and temporal, living at the same time. Your body is temporal. Your spirit is eternal. Therefore, there is going to be a tension because one thing is actually passing away. Every day you live is another day closer to death. Paul talks about this. You know, the, though the outer man may perish, our spirit man is being renewed what? Day by day. And so the, the, the flesh man is temporal, the spirit man, the real man, is eternal, and so there is a tension about wanting to live out the eternal in the new body, but we're stuck in this temporal realm, which we can't escape until the day the Lord for you arrives and you go home to be with glory or he returns. So there's this tension between eternal and temporal just with me. Don't worry about what's going on out there. Just with me, there's a tension. There's a pulling, there's a struggle. And each one is longing for dominance. Your temporal will long for dominance. And yet set your mind on the things of the eternal. Live from the place of the eternal. In, in saying this regarding the temporal, this is under the subheading temporal, temporal doesn't necessarily always mean sinful. Temporary doesn't mean sin. Make sense? But temporary things must be kept in the correct perspective of the eternal. So temporary is not sinful, just in and by itself. But we must keep those temporary things in the correct viewpoint of this is but for a moment. This is not my forever. So we've got to keep it in the right perspective. Temporary, what I touched on before, is subject to change. So why would you build your life on something that is temporal? Why would you build your life on something that is temporal? It's like building your life on the sand. Building a house on the sand. When the floods come, you're going to get washed away. Build your house on what? The rock, which is what? Jesus. Which is through his word. That is building your life, your temporal, on an eternal substance. Yeah? I'm just going to go through these points. Eternal things never change and the temporal is always subject to the eternal or God's word. Your temporal is always sub subject to the eternal. The eternal things. Because the eternal is greater than the temporal. Everything you see that is temporal actually has its root in the eternal realm anyway. You exist because of the eternal realm. I hope this is not too deep. This, I'm just trying to grasp some understanding. The word is eternal. Christ is eternal. God is eternal. His kingdom is eternal. Everything we see around us is temporal. Therefore, because it is temporal, it means it is subject to change. It means if something is going on in your life that is not right, not good, and that you're dealing with, that thing is subject to the word. But in order to bring it under subjection to the word, you have to know who you are, who your God is, and who, what his word says, what his promises are. So you can then bring it from the eternal realm into your temporal realm and change your temporary. Heaven on earth. Heaven, eternal, earth, temporary. But our calling is to bring from the eternal realm, the kingdom of God, into this temporal setting. All temporal problems have eternal solutions. I'm just going to go through this slow. So I just want to, hopefully the penny will drop. All temporal problems, whatever you're going through, whatever you face, whatever your issues are, they all have an eternal solution. And if you look at the governments of the world today, they try to fix temporal problems with temporal solutions. That's why they keep dealing with the same issues over and over. After a decade, after 50 years, after 100 years, over the whole span of this existence of Earth, of human beings, they're all still dealing with the same issues from the beginning. Why? Because they're trying to solve temporal issues with temporal solutions. 
But you are not called to live that way. You are called to enter in and live in your messed up little world, so to speak, but then access something greater than yourself to bring stability and to bring it into subjection to heaven. That's what we're called to do. So temporal solution, temporal problems always have an eternal solution. Christ and his word. Is it okay? All temporal problems have eternal solutions. Jesus knew and demonstrated this. Outside of his preaching, he was known really for his healing ministry. Sickness is temporal. So what did he do? Access the eternal, access heaven, and brought heaven into the temporal, and he changed the temporal. So he knew if someone was blind, well, that's just a temporal issue, I will release the eternal realm, the power of God, where it's perfect, into that, into that scenario, and blind eyes open, or ears open, or the flesh healed from leprosy. <coughs> Jesus knew this. So he was an eternal God operating in a temporal realm, but he knew his temporary wasn't his dominant side. He knew eternity was his dominant side, and he operated from that place, to bring eternity into temporal. He changed the temporal of so many people. Did he change your temporal? He did. Which then changed your eternal. Do I need to relax on this a bit? What did he do when he was in the the boat and there was a storm? Yeah, I, I, that's it. Talk to yourself. Answer the, answer the question. <laughs> there was a storm. Jesus was asleep. He was asleep. The disciples woke him up. Temporal storm. Temporal storm. Temporal storm. Temporal storm. What did he do? He got up, rebuked the storm, and said to the sea, what? Peace be still. And so that also gives an indication. Not only was Jesus master over the temporal, he was master over the unseen. He had mastery over both realms. He rebuked the invisible, which caused the tangible, the physical, the temporal, and there was a great calm. Why? Because he had mastery in both realms, in the seen and the unseen. But because he was more mastery of the unseen, he could control the seen. You try to walk on water. How could he do that? Because he would master the unseen. In the eternal realm, he knew the eternal realm operating through him was greater than the temporal water he would walk on. Mm. That's what I, I sort of respond the same way when I get these points. Mm. Just sit, mm. really? Mm. So don't worry. He was master of the temporal. And the Lord spoke this statement to me the other day. He said, have fun. Enjoy the temporal, just never be mastered by it. You are to be a master of the temporal. Enjoy the temporal. We're temporal beings. We're temporal people. Talking about this man. The inner man is eternal. But we live in a temporal world, so we have to learn to function in a temporal world. We all know how to function in a temporal world. But it's a lot different to mastering a temporal world. So he said, have fun in the temporal, just don't be mastered by it. That's not your God. Your God is not from the temporal. Mm -hmm. So you are to be a master of the temporal. So the temporal is okay. Again, the the temporal is not sin. Again, Again, looking and keeping it in the right perspective. So next point is the warnings of the temporal. Adam and Eve self destructed because of a temporal moment. They were living in the realm of heaven on earth. There was no separation, so to speak. It was just heaven, 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 heaven. But they were living in temporal type environments. There was was seasons, but there was not necessarily time. But because of one act of a temporal moment, they destroyed their future. Anyone done one temporal act they cause absolute chaos in your own life. 
You're lying. <laughs> Again, we've all done it. We've all done the wrong thing. We've said the wrong thing. We've thought the wrong thing. And it's created a repercussion of events we weren't prepared for, nor did we want to walk into. But I had to take responsibility because my temporal moment messed up the next thing I had to walk into. That's what Adam and Eve did. They messed it up for all of us because of a temporal moment. The temporal became their God. And because the temporal thing of eating the fruit became their God, they lost it all. And that's a warning for all of us. Never be subjected to temporal things. Never allow a temporal now to destroy your future. Mm Mm-hmm. Sin really has its influence, that's all right, in the temporal. Heaven is not influenced by sin. And we know the power of sin has been destroyed through the blood of Christ. But it doesn't mean sin still does not have influence over the world. We know that. So these are the warnings of the temporal. Sin will never try to get hold of you in the eternal. It can't. It'll have to work through some temporary situation to try to get you off course. In 1 Corinthians 6, because the next point is, all temporal things should still bring God honour. Paul talks about this, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. So he's talking about temporal things. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful, or they're not beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. What's he saying? I am a master of the temporal. And I'm not going to let any situation, any circumstance or any problem that faces me to become my overlord. I am a master of whatever I come up against. That's a mentality. Foods for the stomach and food and stomach for foods, but God would, will destroy both. <laughs> it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Okay, your body, your temporal, is for Him. Your temporal is for the eternal. Is the Lord eternal? Yes, He is. Your body's temporal, but your body, your temporal, is for the eternal things of God. And the Lord for the body. And God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? So your temporal is a house of the eternal. The Holy Spirit's eternal. Your body, temporal, is the holding place of heaven, God, the Spirit, the eternal. So you know what I mean when I said... You are temporal and eternal, living at the same time. You're a temporal body housing an eternal God. And the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Glorify God in your body. So a lot of the modern day preaching where they say, well, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm under grace and I can do whatever I want, say whatever I want, be whatever I want, sleep with whoever I want, sleep with whatever gender I ever I want, because God loves me and I'm under grace and, you know, all that sort of fun stuff, that's garbage. He says, glorify God with your body and your spirit. But the spirit is what brings your body under subjection. So I'm not trying to do things and physically in my own strength to bring this flesh or body into subjection. 
I do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. All temporal matters must be approached with great wisdom because your temporal action can cause a brother in Christ to fall. And Paul talks about this. I don't have time to, to go in there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 to 9, Paul talks about whether you know, food is nothing, whether it's offered to idols or not offered to idols. But it basically he says, if I'm going to do anything in my temporal that is going to cause my brother to fall, I won't do it. The temporal, you must have great wisdom in your temporal to not make your brothers and sisters fall. That's what Paul said. So if my actions, certain things I do, are going to create a stone for you to fall over, I have to have the wisdom not to to create a trip up for you. Me as an individual. That's why Paul says, if me eating meat offered to idols is going to be an offence to someone to cause someone who doesn't understand the true freedom there is in Christ, I won't do it. So there is a wisdom and responsibility that comes with living in the realm of the temporal, though all things are lawful, though I'm free to do anything. But not all things are beneficial and not all things are helpful for me and not all things are helpful for you. Is this okay? And the temporal can be such a distraction, it can alienate you from the things of the eternal. And if we're all honest, we all know we are dominated by the things of the temporal. Because we live here. And we deal with temporal things every day. I have to deal with me because I'm temporal. This thing. So I'm living with temporal things every day. And work will want me. TV wants me. Facebook wants me. Music wants me. Books want me. All these temporal things want me every day. They scream for my attention. Scream. And they scream for your attention. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Do me, do me, do me. Do this, do that, do this, do that. Come, go, come, go. Eat, swallow, eat, swallow. (laughs) Or temporal. Screaming for your attention. And God says, don't look at it. Don't focus on it. There is a greater realm for you to be fixated in. It's with me. It's in that which you can't see. Jesus says this, anyone who wants to come after me must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. What does deny himself mean? Is that, well, I'm temporal. So for me to follow after Christ, I have to deny my temporal things. It doesn't mean I deny a temporal life because I live in a temporal world, I live in a temporal body, and I have to deal with temporal things. But he says, as long as that is your God, you can't come after me. You must deny yourself. That means deny the things of the temporal. Doesn't mean you can't enjoy the things of the temporal, but as long as the things of the temporal are more important than the things of the eternal, you have a new God. I'm not trying to come down heavy, I just want the truth. Because the temporal things can destroy me if I don't master them. He didn't say escape the temporal. He said, deny it. Deny those things for my cause, if that's what it comes down to. Now the eternal. Why is the eternal so important? I've been reading through scriptures this week and even just meditating on certain scriptures and anything that has an eternal reference, like God or Jesus or Holy Spirit or kingdom, I'm just not replacing, but I'm just reading it with the word eternal in its place, just to give me a greater thinking and understanding of what the Lord's actually trying to convey um, through his word. So some scriptures like John 3, why is the eternal so important? Because you were born from there. This is where Nicodemus meets with Jesus, and Jesus says, unless a man or a woman be born from above, 
They cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless they're born of the spirit and of the water, they shall not see the kingdom of God. So, born from above. Okay, what's above? Above is heaven. What's heaven? Heaven's eternal. So, I was born, not this, when you are born again, your spirit is reborn, not from the earth realm, from the eternal realm. Does this make sense? You're an eternal being living in a temporal body, remember. So you were born again from the eternal. Your nature is eternal. Your very nature is eternal. 2 Peter 1 to 4, And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. What are promises? Are they temporal or eternal? Did God speak the promises? That means they're eternal. These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruptions caused by human temporal desires. These are the eternal promises that enable you to share in his divine nature. Is his divine nature eternal? Has his nature, his righteousness now been imputed to you? This has. That means your nature is an eternal nature. It's not something that changes all the time. Your mind might flip around, but your nature doesn't. Why? Because you're born of God. And if you're born of God, you're born of his nature. That means that nature is an eternal nature. That's actually who I am more than this thing that you see. You are seated in heavenly places, okay? I am seated in the eternal. I live in the temporal in this life, but I'm actually seated right now in eternal places. That means if I'm seated in eternal places in Christ, I then can access the mastery of the temporal. It is from that place we access the mastery of this temporal world. So we're not subject to the things of the temporal. Why? Because I was born from above, I'm seated in the eternal, and I have eternal promises to outwork in this temporal world. And you... What's that? that was Ephesians 2.6. In Romans 8.14, they that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Okay, the Spirit. Is the Spirit eternal? Okay, so they that are led by the eternal, the things of the eternal, are the sons of God. It doesn't say those that are led by their flesh, they that are led by their senses, they that are led by their eyes or their ears or their nose or tongue or skin, they're not the sons. It's not talking about this. Those that are led in the eternal things of God, these are the sons of God. And the sons of God, you can really tell who they are because they're always seeking after the things of the eternal. They that seek after the eternal, they that are led by the eternal, these are the sons of God. My favourite scripture, repent for the kingdom has arrived. I have to change my thinking because I'm now born from the eternal realm, live in the eternal realm, live from the eternal realm. The kingdom is eternal. God is eternal. I have to renew my mind completely to this truth that I live in a temporary world, but I live from an eternal place. And this is the kicker, and then we're going to have communion. Matthew 6.25, another great scripture I love. Do not worry about your life, Jesus says, about what you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you'll wear, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and more than bread and more than clothing, all these things. But you, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, but you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything you need shall be added to you. Again, I put in here some eternal words and temporal world words to give it greater context. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your temporal life. Because it says, do not worry about your life. Okay, what is this life? It's temporal. Do not worry about your temporal life what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body or what you'll put on, is life is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Is not life more than temporal things? Therefore, do not worry about temporal things, saying, what shall we eat? Temporal. What shall we drink? Temporal. What shall we wear? Temporal. For after all these temporal things, the Gentiles seek. Go after temporal things. Go after temporal success. Go after temporal reputations. Go after temporal desires. 
That's what the Gentiles seek. That's what non-believers seek after. But your heavenly Father knows that you need all these temporal things. God doesn't deny your need for temporal things. He denies you seeking after them. But seek first the eternal things, the kingdom of God and his eternal righteousness and all these temporal things shall be added to you. God doesn't deny your need for temporal things. He denies your focus and worry for them. And if we're all, again, truthful, we've all worried about money, we've all worried about some sort of food, we've all worried about some sort of clothing, we've all worried about how am I going to deal with this or do that or do this or do that, and it creates stress, creates anxiety, creates worry. If we're all truthful, we've all done it. What have I done? Forgot about where I'm seated, where I was born from, and from what realm I'm meant to operate in. He doesn't deny our need for the temporal. He made us temporal in this life. He knows it. Doesn't the scripture say he, when you pray, he already knows what you need before you ask? How many of us actually pray for eternal things? Most of our prayers are based around temporal things, which is okay, because if I'm asking him for them, that means I'm not actually fully seeking after them. That's good. I'm keeping things in the right perspective, knowing my source is from the eternal realm. But when you stress over them, when you lose sleep over them, when you worry about them, I'm taking myself away from the eternal things of God. Stay in the realm of heaven. Keep my mind on things above where Christ is seated. Last week we spoke about three eternal things, praise and worship, seeking the word and giving. For me, this is one of the most significant things I can do that connects me with eternity. Jesus says, I am the eternal bread. He who does not partake of me does not have eternal life, but he who does partake of me has eternal life. He who, eats my, he who does not eat my flesh and does not eat my blood has no part in me. But if I eat of his flesh and I eat of his blood, that means I am partaking of eternal substance. Communion is just not a temporary thing. This is what has completely changed my eternal. This is what has completely allowed me to operate from the eternal. This is what allowed me to see, be seated in heavenly places in Christ. This is what allowed me to be born again from above. This is what allows me to access the promises of his word. It is all through this. A temporary moment of Jesus on a cross created eternal ramifications for me to be able to walk into. This is reminding me that I, where I'm seated. This is reminding me of my inheritance. This is reminding me of the God I serve. This is reminding me that I am healed. This is reminding me that I am blessed, eternally blessed. I am eternally healed. I am eternally fruitful. I am eternally seated with God. I am eternally going to be praising him. I am eternally going to be worshipping him. I am eternally going to be in his presence, which is fullness of joy, all because of a temporal moment on a cross created an eternal future for me. So this is the difference with Adam and Eve. In, when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the garden, they created an eternal outwalking for us to death. But because Jesus came in and changed the pathway, I now enter into an eternal pathway of life. It's not about temporal. It's about eternal. My salvation is of the eternal. The blood is eternal. Where is the blood of Jesus right now? That's not a trick question. Where is the blood of Jesus right now? It's in heaven. Why? Because he passed through the heavens, went into the sanctuary and put his blood upon the altar. So his blood which was shed in the temple has now been taken into the eternal. 
gives you an understanding now why your tithes can be put in the temporal but then be entered into the eternal. There's something happens that we can't see. But I know I'm partaking of temporal things here by the blood of Jesus and his body, but I really am accessing and eating of eternal life. It's not just drinking grape juice and it's not just eating bread. Again, I mentioned three things last week which connect us to eternal relevance. This is the biggest. This is the biggest. Why? Because it didn't start with me. It started with Christ. He gave me eternal relevance. He gave up his temporal for my eternal. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. His, he knew it was temporal. The cross was temporal. The death was temporal to give access to you for the eternal. That's why I can eat and drink this with great joy and with great humility and with great thankfulness because without the blood and the body of Christ, I had nothing. Nothing. None of this would even matter. None of it would matter. If, we didn't, if I didn't have this, if we didn't have this, none of this would matter. None of this would matter. None of what we would do would matter. It's all through the blood of Christ which has given us eternal relevance in everything that we do. Oh, I'm thankful for the blood. So thankful for the blood of Jesus. That in his temporal moment, he gave me eternal future and eternal life. And eternal life is this, that I may know the Father, know God. So let's stand this morning.